Cougs house. The Houston Cougars are 1-0 after playing tremendous, great defense that we all thought they were known for. Right, guys? Right, guys? You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Lock on Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach Parker Answers, here to break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater who came to stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way you can place the Cougs into your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. It's good to see you again if that's where you have found us. Remember, doing giveaways every 250 subscribers. And if you're looking now, yes, we are just over 1,500. So we're going to give away a hat just like this one I have on to a person who is frequently watching, liking, and commenting. The YouTube handle is at Ross Sosa, R-A-S-S-O-S. Hey, it's a lot of S's, but Ross Sosa, well, you call me Blur because you think I talk too fast, and you're probably right there. Please be sure to find me on some sort of social media handle at Painsworth512, uh, wherever you decide to subscribe to social media, and we'll be happy to talk about getting you a hat just like the one I've got on. All right, so we're going to be another way up giveaway at 700, 1,750 subscribers. So if you're sore about this one, just keep hitting subscribe, keep hitting like, keep hitting comments, and tell us that you're in the next contest. We're going to figure out what we want to give away at that marker. Uh, if, after talking about the game, you are tired of talking about the game at the end of this, A, I'd ask what's wrong with you, but B, I'd ask you, before you give up talking about this game, tell us what you thought of the final series, which ultimately led to victory formation after a controversial uh, third down conversion. All right. So I want to talk some about this game. It was a chaotic game. We'll talk first in the first segment, just some overall takeaways on the game as a whole, because it was kind of a different game for the Houston Cougars under one Dana Holgerson. Things looked a little different. I was in the second segment talking about Donovan Smith and his first outing in a Houston Cougar jersey. Um, I have some things I like that I think that people didn't pick up on. I, I want to make sure we give him his flowers. I also think there's natural room to grow as anyone would have in their first game in a new system. More on that later. And the final segment, we are going to talk about the short king that led the defense to a defensive victory. But first, let's break down the, the overall game itself. If you were unavailable to get to it couldn't get to a tv you weren't one of the thirty-seven thousand people there in person houston did beat utsa 17 to 14 Donovan smith had 220 233 yards two touchdowns he threw 64 percent completions houston added 100 yards on the ground um they had a bunch of different guys that had at least a catch sam brown and joseph manjack led the, led the way with six catches a piece uh manjack and matthew golden both had touchdowns um big big game on that side of the ball uh for sam brown i would point out the giant catch at 47 yarder but the defense led the way Malik robinson led them with six tackles nelson caesar had a uh, sack you also had a pair of malik fleming interceptions um you also had a Traylon Payne interception more on that later uh houston was really able to bottle up frank harris now admittedly frank harris had a chaotic off season and was not quite the same frank harris or did not look to be the same frank harris we might have seen a year ago but you do play the guys that line up and frank harris was lined up there right um Houston held him to just a touchdown and three interceptions, uh, kind of the inverse of, of what it looked like a year ago on that front. Um, UTSA did have some success running the football. They had uh, 208 yards on the ground. And so, you know, that'll be something we talk about in the defensive segment that was fairly impressive on their behalf. Houston was able to bottle up all but one receiver. Only two receivers had more than a single catch for the UTSA Roadrunners, one of those being Joshua Cephas, who had nine catches for 123 yards and that touchdown. So, you know, again, pretty good job across the board on most of the guys, but Cephas did indeed get his. Um, in the course of this game, a couple of things uh, stuck out to me first. We probably talk about the uniforms and all the fun stuff, the chaos involved in that because it was a fun level of chaos and excitement. Um, Houston, Followed a classic like Houston hip hop slab on their way into the stadium for the Cougar Walk. Comes out in the Houston Oilers blues. All kinds of 
Andre Ware and other types of alumni out there in the Houston Oilers colors. Um, we've done a show about the Houston uniforms. If you go back and check the catalog, I don't mean to spend this whole episode talking about the marketing fail that it might have been to not have that kind of stuff for sale at the game. However, I will say that they were a hit across the board. National media picked it up on Saturday when talking about how good the uniforms looked. Not just Houston folks, not just Texas folks, not just Big 12 folks. National media talking about it. it made ESPN's College Game Day did a segment on it, right? This was a big, big deal for Houston. Recruits commenting on it. Players loving it. Dana said in the post game, trying to steal the uniforms to take home because they were supposed to give them back. They may wear them later this season. We shall see. Now, it was a slow start for both teams as far as, far as the game once it got started. Um, looked like they are kind of getting used to playing full speed. you got to remember in college football, unlike pro football, and frankly, unlike high school football, unlike any other level of football, college football does not have a preseason set of games. And so this is their first time with what we'd call live bullets, right? The first time playing someone real. Um, I did do a whole highlight thread of tweets over the course of the game. If you go back and find those on Twitter slash X, I'm going to keep calling it Twitter for now. Um, but you can go back and check those for more like an almost play by play kind of update. I will say Tony Mathis can start running back did attack the gaps of the middle and frankly had a fairly better game. I think than people realized because he ran into some plugged holes early, but continued just the ground game. And overall Tony Mathis ended the game as Houston's leading rusher and had 4.8 yards per carry. Um, I think obviously it's helped a lot by the 21 yard carry near the end, but it's worth pointing out that like, they kept plugging it up the gut. And while people were frustrated, this is conservative. This is old. This is what are we doing here? Blah, 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 blah. Eventually, that did wear the UTSA front down. And UTSA, while they are a group of five team, has power five size defensive tackles. That's 330 pounds at a couple different inside spots. Are giant, giant people there. And again, that's the kind of movement you want to see in the offense. It was not, I don't think, what Imanya Gavi wants. I think they'll have a more successful run game as the year goes on. They can have some tape to critique and get better from and those kinds of things. Um, I mentioned Sam Brown was six for six, six targets, six hatches, uh, big yardage plays. Um, in the post game, he talked about you know finding stuff pre-snap, and I think he was one of a number of receivers that was in the f- – idea of playing against live bullets a lot of Dana's, Dana's offense if you're doing you know traditional air raid schemes and he still has a lot of that in his past game stuff is if this then that if they line up in this kind of man if this kind of you know one hide then, then I'm going to this and that and making those kinds of reads against a starting defense that's disguising things on the fly that you have not played against before kind of takes him getting used to uh, and for the first game with the uh, Bra- Sam Brown and Joseph Manjack both looked like they'd played in the system before. I think that's probably why they had such such successful outings. It looked like UTSA's goal was to take uh, Matthew Golden away, and with the exception of his big touchdown catch, it kind of felt like they did. Um, Now, that said, it opened up other guys, and that was fine. Matthew Golden still ended up getting a number of targets, but they did kind of seem forced at one point, but that's fine. The big stretch of game worth talking about, though, is the final four minutes. Now, In the final four minutes, um, we ultimately get to a third and three. um, But before we got to that third and three that became the controversial end of game play, you had a third and three like a a full three plays earlier in which Donovan Smith has a snap, gets to catch the snap. There's a couple different fake stuff going on in the backfield, and he kind of has an RPO it looked like to me like he's making a pre-snap read on what his run pass option was. And when he pulls the ball back to throw, I'm like, Oh no, what's he doing? Right? Because Donald Smith had played a clean game to this point. And frankly, I remember Houston picking him off a couple times last year. I was like, Oh no, what's going to go on? What's happening here? But he threads the needle to one Michael Laughlin, the tight end for a first down directly between a pair of UTSA defenders. Now I have to say that in the post game, Don Smith had words to say about that. Um, it was also like that first down led to the three plays that eventually got Houston another first down in the game. The ultimate play that ended the game was the Thomas Smith three yard run that had it been 2.99 yards, would have been fourth and inches. Had it been 3.01 yards, Jeff Trailer would have shut up and stopped talking about it. And instead, the controversial uh, reviewed play did eventually get to a Houston first down to the line of the victory formation in the game. But what I don't understand about that, and we're all in this quick segment talking about the blues winning the game here is that it was third down Houston has a 245 pound quarterback that can run over people. 
I don't understand why UTSA is both on the sideline in the post game and on social media, all the places acting like if Houston doesn't get that first down on the third, they win. Houston would have just lined up and gone for it on fourth. They'd done it earlier in the game. I don't understand necessarily why that's the, the move there. I think Houston still probably gets the first down on the fourth down play and ultimately gets to kneel it out as they did on the whole strong impressions of the defense. I want to talk some about Donovan Smith leading the offense, but first I want to make sure we talk, take some time to talk about our friends at athletic brewing. Now I've had a chance to try some athletic brewing. I really, really enjoy the sours when they're nice and cold and it's nice and hot outside. It is really Really refreshing because Athletic Brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They can make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. I know I stumbled over that because it's hard to imagine, but they have a non-alcoholic beer that actually tastes good. Their brews are great tasting and award-winning and beat out full-strength beers in global competitions. They have over 50 styles of craft of non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, Golden's, those sours I like, and more. They're constantly releasing limited edition experimental styles to add their variety to make sure to check them out. They're fit for all time, so you can drink them anytime, anywhere, and make any activity more enjoyable, like watching the big game as we all did Saturday, watching the next big game as we are going to this Saturday, etc. You can have them at work or working out because they are non-alcoholic. You have no hangovers with them ever. You can find athletic brewing in store online and at bars around the country, the fastest growing non-alcoholic beer in the U S so get on board. Again, I'm a fan of the sours. I think you like them too. On a hot day, if you had a nice cold, cold sour, trust me, it's going to be good. You find alcoholic, you can have find non-alcoholic brews, from Athletic Brewing at a store near you or buy online at athleticbrewing.com. For first-time customers can use promo code Locked On to get 15% off your first order. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer exclusion supply. Uh, Athletic Brewing Company fit for all times. All right, so I mentioned I want to talk some about Don and Smith, and I think – I'm higher on his performance, I think, than it looks like consensus is out there in all of the fan talkosphere, all of the 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 social medias and the message boards and all those kinds of things. Um, because I saw a different Donovan Smith in his first game in Houston than I had seen in his first games or his you know more problematic games and low scoring games at Texas Tech. Do I think he's got a high ceiling to reach still? Yes. Do I think he's got a long way to get there? Yes, but I do think there were some things he did. So I first want to go to his own post-game comments because I think that helped shed some light on what he was going through a little bit. He said he did have some first-game jitters, but eventually, in the sounds like someone in the first half, he did relax and just do what he'd been taught. Those were his words. Um, but he said everyone's excited and to come out with a win. That's the main thing, and got to keep the main thing the main thing. I think that's what you got to keep in mind with this guy is he does – do whatever it takes to win. He is a winning quarterback, right? He might not have the most gaudy pass numbers. He is a running quarterback that doesn't exactly go 4-4 or anything like that. He runs through people, right? But he does what it takes to win. I appreciate it in the post game, where, you know, quarterbacks are asked questions about their own performance. Whenever asked about stuff that he can work on, he owned it. And whenever asked about things that went well, he deflected it to his teammates. When asked about, you know, some of the big passing plays to Brown and Manchak, he said, Everyone talking about wide receivers is really good, right? He talked about how great of a room that is. When asked about having a turnover free game and a low penalty, Houston just had four penalties in this game, which is stark contrast to last year's team. Instead of taking credit for like running a clean game and not turning the ball over, he talked about how impactful it was that the defense forced three turnovers and also did not have any penalty. Like, that, I think, is a strong, strong reflection of leadership out of the kid. Again, I open with, but he had 64% completions, two touchdowns, 233 yards, and no picks. Generally speaking, if you're talking about a guy's first start in a brand new system, that's hard to beat, right? I understand that we probably would have liked to add one or two more touchdowns. I understand that he did take three sacks instead of trying to force the ball here and there and turn the ball over. And I understand that when the Dana Holgerson system has been running smoothly, we're seeing more gaudy pass numbers. So I think people are just like, what's going on? And they think about how talented a receiver room is and don't get his UTSA. UTSA is good. First of all, I want to point out that they have a good chance to win the American athletic conference, right? That's a strong football team. They won the conference USA twice in a row have, you know, 
uh, 12 wins last year. It was 11 last year and 12 the year before, something like that, right? Like good, good football team. Um, but I think that good football team aside that they're playing against, I think having a guy that steps in, new system, first time out there, throws the ball to the right team, takes care of it. When putting in a compromising situation where he has to like make a play or whatever, he just, you know, he understands the, they have the lead. He'll tuck the ball and take the sack, right? He's big and strong. It doesn't like phase him at all. Um, and I also think that there were moments where Houston's not showing their full hand with this guy. And rem- we got to remember that the season is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, we did not see a ton of drawn up run up run plays for Smith. Now some of that might have been that there are RPOs we're not necessarily in you know in tune with that he either hands the ball off or pulls it and throws it or doesn't ever fake the run himself, right? That's their offense. And while I can see some of that, some of that you also have to be on the headsets to hear, right? But I also think that there's got to be entire run packages because of how talented runner he is that will compromise defenses in a way that you might save for conference. You might save for Texas. You might save for Tech or TCU or I guess, you know, those Techs and TCU both lost this weekend, but whatever, you know, may have may happen. Um, I will say that um, Holgerson said to land this in the post game, and I appreciated as a coach that Holgerson also didn't sugarcoat things. When asked directly about Donovan Smith's performance, he said it was spotty, but a new offense and everything is new to him. And, you know, after saying that, Holgerson said that he appreciated that Donovan was poised, did not seem wide-eyed. The sold-out stadium did not, like, freak him out because he's used to playing in front of big crowds in the Big 12 and that kind of stuff. Um, and then I I echo what uh, Dana said and what Donovan would not take credit for because he gave the credit to the wide receivers. There were multiple throws where there was to Manjack. There was one on the left side of the field to Sam Brown or the one to Michael Lawson we opened in the first segment with where, honestly – Donna Smith threads the needle in a way that you know, out of the 133 division one FBS starting quarterbacks, like probably over a hundred throw interceptions on, right? He threads the needle in a spot where he gets it to his guy, but to where just his guy can get it and puts a ton of zip on it. That seemed a consistent thing in all three of those plays. I'm thinking of all the top of my head where part of it was he put the ball where just his guy could get it and threw it so hard and fast that the defense couldn't react fast enough to get to it. Um, I, I think that, you know, there were throws that wowed people that maybe didn't get caught as well, right? That just may come down to get on the same page. There was a throw where he's on the run scrambling out to his right, and he sees Matthew Golden streaking across the field as well. And um, he put a little bit too much mustard on it probably, and it goes through the backside of Matthew Golden's hands um, and goes incomplete, right? That's the kind of thing where they continue to play together that I think you see completed. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. That almost because they still saw one another feels like a positive to me i also think there are different times where he showed off the de- depth he has in the arm I mean, he has a cannon for an arm and so overthrowing people almost felt impressive at times i know that that's weird maybe to say but like there was like oh if if the receivers are down like he can put the ball 60 yards 70 yards down there and so i think those are going to work in his favor um i think the way that he grows and i'll probably wrap with this i don't mean to wrap with the negative but the way that i think he grows here right is there were times where and admittedly, it's going to happen with a guy in a new offense. There were times where it looked like he'd take the snap, his first read's taken away because they would double Matthew Golden. And he may, I'm assuming his first read's Matthew Golden, but his first read appeared to be taken away. And he's like going through the checklist in his head of what comes next. And that's very natural for a quarterback in his first year in his system to be going through. But in doing that, it allowed a good defensive line to get after him a little bit. Um, I also think it's worth pointing out that like his instinct, and I think it's the correct instinct when he's feeling that pressure is to get out of the pocket and move around a little bit, but scramble drill, that stuff where you move around a little bit requires having played together a lot. Quarterbacks have to kind of trust where the receivers are going. Receivers have to kind of trust that they know the quarterback is looking right. Like all those kinds of things kind of have to work in concert with one another. And for a first game, that can be really, really challenging. I think those are all things that he will grow with as the unit grows together. Um, I thought it was interesting. And what I would be interested to know, if you have insight, feel free to talk to me about it. Um, it appeared that in the late third quarter, I didn't think it looked like that. I thought Matthew Golden was just like trying to get everyone amped up. But people were saying Matthew Golden looked frustrated. 
And then very shortly thereafter, it looked like Houston went for a series that just tried to force the ball to Matt a couple times. Eventually, and then ultimately, it did lead to a great Matthew Golden touchdown catch on a beautifully thrown ball by Donovan Smith. What I wonder is, is that coach calling Matthew Golden's number, right? Coach Burchette was the guy we were told pregame was calling the plays on Saturday. And so is he trying to, you know, get Matthew the ball to kind of ease his frustrations? Is that Donovan Smith as a leader trying to say, hey, man, I'm looking for you. I promise we'll take a couple plays trying to, like, trying to get you the rock. Or is that Matthew Golden just shrieking across the field more open because he's frustrated and running fast? Like when you get angry, you work out fast, right? Like I don't know what the answer to those things are, but it did seem to like happen one right after the other. And if that is Donovan Smith trying to say, hey, man, I'm looking for you. I promise my somewhat controversial opinion and i'll leave it here is i don't hate that i don't hate that because i think that wide receivers look for that kind of stuff i think it's important to build that relationship with your number one target your number one talented target anyway i don't know if it end up being a number one target in the season but certainly matthew golden the most talented receiver on the roster right um i don't think that's a bad thing if anything i think it's a good leadership thing to be like hey look we're up 10 we got a second I'm going to show you I really am looking for you. You might feel frustrated, but I'm going to show you I am looking to call your number. And again, I, I know that there are some people like, no, it's supposed to be the same. Always make the right read. Sometimes you trust Jimmy and Joe's more than X's and O's. And I don't hate Donald Smith saying, listen, I got a great Jimmy and they got a not so great Joe. I'm going to try and find him, right? It's frankly how they got the one-on-one -on -one matchup that got Golden Sush on the end zone, uh, down inside the red zone, you know, later in, in the early fourth. Um. I want to talk some about a defensive name that I think comes to mind when I think about this game because he's my easy, easy pick for the MVP of the football game. But first, we got to talk about our buddies at FanDuel because FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And this upcoming weekend, we have the NFL season. If you want to get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers, you can go to FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets, guaranteed plus. All customers who bet $5 get $100 off Sunday NFL ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can bet on everything from point spreads to player props and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. If you go to FanDuel.com and if you go to the NFL section, you can start to look for the different things. They got the Houston Texans as a 10-point dog at Baltimore. Now, I get why you'd favor Baltimore in that game. But I also think that one tank Dell for the Houston Texans will be a difference maker. I don't know that the Texans actually win that game. I'm not that silly, but 10 points is a lot in an NFL game. And I'm thinking you should go put some cash on the Texans. I'm telling you, you should do it at FanDuel.com. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right. So I said, I want to talk about the short man that led the defense. And that short man that led the defense is none other than 5'8", short king Malik Fleming. Malik Fleming, you remember, is a transfer in from East Carolina. He is a transfer in that made an impact right away with an early punt return for a big... It set up a big touchdown to Joseph Manjack a few plays later. He also had two picks later in the game. But as I said on Twitter on Sunday, as impressive as his game was, and we'll break down more than a second... I thought his post-game commentary was even more impressive. It's available on YouTube. Uh, UH Content Solutions puts all the post-game stuff out, so make sure, make sure you go check that out there. But uh, I believe it was Joseph Duarte that asked him about coming to Houston because Dana Holgerson said, and I guess it's probably back when go, Dana Holgerson spoke first, when I asked about Malik's game, he said that he knew from watching him cover Tankdale at East Carolina. He's like, I want that guy, right? Sam Brown said he's an electric football player. We played against him every day in practice. Now, I'm just Donovan Smith said that kid has been making plays every day at practice, right? This was not a surprise to folks in the locker room, but it was a surprise to a lot of people watching because he was not the big sexy name transfer that people saw coming, right? Duarte asked him, I believe it was Duarte, directly about coming to Houston. And as a student of the game, he said he it was a no-brainer. He looked around and he looked at what Houston has done with short corners, undersized corners like Marcus Jones and Marius Williams. Marion Williams, were the selling point to him to transfer to Houston. It was a no-brainer, and he said, quote, I want to be a part of that. He even cited a interaction he had with Marcus Jones a couple years back. He said East Carolina came to Houston, um, so that would have been two years ago, and Marcus Jones was running a kickoff back, and they had spent this whole time you know, on special teams. He's a younger football player at that point, getting ready to make sure they bottle on Marcus Jones, and he said the opening kickoff, like, 
that Marcus Jones had a very normal mundane return. And Malik made some smart comment to him like, you ain't got it like that. Or something to that effect. That uh, Malik said it better, and he might have even been saying it nicer to us as as folks than he said it to Marcus. And Marcus kind of gave him a look like, "Okay, bet." And then the next kickoff return, he's oh, sorry, Marcus Jones made some comment like, "Okay, bet. I'm going to take next from the house." The next kickoff return, Marcus Jones did take it back to the house. And he said, "In watching what Houston did with Marcus Jones and how Marcus Jones was developed into that guy, he's like, that's a place I can go and do those same things." They turned him into that guy. I can also become that guy. Um, now I have to say that what I was really impressed by with him was at five foot eight, he tracked Cephas around a lot in the second half. Not a lot in the first half, but I do think that they made some sort of adjustment on who covers who in man coverage when they went straight man, um, and they moved Fleming over. Fleming's a great guy with his hips and really smart with his hands. And what I liked about his first interception. Uh, and I want to talk about what he said in his post game about the put first interception as well. But what I like about the first interceptions, it felt like by sitting on top of the route, he actually limited how deep the receiver could go. And that's when he made the big backward leaping diving catch for the interception. Um, I thought it was fascinating that as he walks through the interception in the post game, um, it becomes very apparent that A, Malik Fleming is sharp. He's a sharp, sharp young kid. Uh, sorry, he's not a young kid. He's a college kid, but he's sharp, sharp, right? And he talked about how when he lined up in the slot covering, the, the covering, I believe it was Cephas, he saw a guy on the inside that number, you know, so the number three receiver that really had doesn't get the ball out in Sky Report, hadn't got the ball out in this game. So he pretty much knew that he was going to be working one to two and one ran a short right, right away. And he knew from a second step in his back pedal that, he had the deep ball on this, right? And he's working backpedaling on it. He talks about how he tracks the hip, tracks the hip, and he sees the receiver kind of flip his eyes back to the quarterback, and that's when he knows the ball's been thrown because of their timing, right? Um, really, really impressive answer as far as film study goes. He had a similar kind of answer for his other pick as well. Um, but the idea that he is processing this in real time before the snap, the kid's a smart football player. It's not just a kid that um, – and not just a kid that is athletically talented because he is athletic talented at five, eight. He is very, very strong and fast and quick and great with his hips and good hands and all that kind of stuff too. But he's very, very smart and knows a lot about what he's doing. He was not the only playmaker on the defense, but I do want to think he deserved an extra bit of shine here. Um, and he, Malik Fleming gets my game MVP if I'm handing one out, but Traylon Payne also had a pick where he baited a receiver look like to me uh, into running a comeback route and then picked it off as Frank Harris will back to throw it for UTSA. Um, shouts to, I don't remember exactly which one of you it was, but shouts to the one of you online that uh, said when I did my linebacker, I forget if it's linebacker. Anyway, when I did one of my preview type shows before the season started, said I didn't talk about Traylon Payne enough. I was going to regret those words. I don't know that I'm regretting those words. I'm pretty happy that Traylon Payne had a big interception, but I definitely thought of, Whatever commenter of you that was when he made the interception goes a great, great play by him. Nelson Cedar had the first and lone sack of the game. Um, and frankly, Dana said it too in the, after the game. I think they did a pretty good job of bottling up Frank Harris because of the crush rush they did and ran. That is, the ends had free reign to rush up field while the defense tackles kind of worked at the line of scrimmage. We had nowhere to go up the gut. Um, if anything, the big, big injury, and I don't mean to leave the episode on a downer, but the big, big injury that kind of the only real flaw in the defense, as I saw it, was once Dot Wonkwa went down, I believe it was in the late first quarter, um, Houston's defense looked different. And you and I spoke on Friday, and I said I thought Dot Wonkwa would be a key difference maker in this football game. Um, I thought he would dominate that center, and to that point he had. Um, I thought his domination of that center would cut off the run game and keep Frank Harris from scrambling. Um, and to that point it did. And then once Dot went out, it was kind of a whole different ball game rushing the ball up the middle, right? Um, Dot appears to have an ankle injury. It sounds like there was no timetable in the post game on his return. For what's worth, I guess Malik Fleming looked like he had some cramps too um, in the game. Uh, but Dot looked like a more serious ankle injury. He did not return in the game. We're hoping that it's just something where he can kind of shake off in a week or two with some tape, but ankles can be weird. So obviously, uh, we're all thinking about you, Dot, if, if this gets your way. Um, as far as the football goes, and sometimes injuries can make that feel secondary, um, it was a big loss to not have him in the middle of dominating. And it's not that 
Cedric Williams or, or whomever. It's not that those. It's not that they weren't Jamar uh, Cald- Caldwell too. It's not that they weren't making plays in the middle. It's that they had a lot more variance, a lot like high highs and low lows, high highs and low lows. With Dot and Wonko, there's no low lows, right? And so it's either he's making the play or he's solidly holding down the gap and taking on the double team. There's no movement of him. They're not shoving him out of the way. They're not blocking him one on one. They're they're not doing those kinds of things, right? And with got the guys that came in after him, they were able to do that, right? So it was a big, big difference, a noticeable difference. And you saw a lot more UTSA running the ball up the gut. I mean, I, I don't have it play by play right here in front of me because it's not quite broken down like that on this breakdown. But if I look at the UTSA box score and I see that they had 208 yards on the ground, uh, Kavarian Barnes had 16 carries for 103 yards. I would bet of the 208 yards, like 190 of them came after the Nwankwo injury in late first quarter. Some of that's because he got injured early, admittedly, right? They would have had some rush yards, I'm sure, over the course of the game. They practiced too. But some of that is because Houston was missing one of their best players. And I think that that's something to keep in mind. As strong as the defense was, right? They kept a team that scored over 36 points per game a year ago and returned a lot of the same talent. Not all the same talent, but a lot of the same talent, Right. As good as this team and Coach Trailer and that whole staff at UTSA is, Houston's defense held them to 14 points. Houston's defense held them to less than 420 yards, right? Um, and frankly, turned them over three times, right? If, had Houston's offense take, you know, been more in sync and been working together more and been able to take advantage of those turnovers, we're probably talking about a blowout, right? I mean, frankly, had Houston made the field goal they missed early in the game, it, it might not have felt as close as it was anyway. Right. And I think there's a lot more to break down on this game. So we're out of time today, but I do want to spend tomorrow's game doing a little bit deeper dive in the tape. So make sure you check back in tomorrow because I want to deep dive the tape a little bit and talk about exactly what kinds of X's and O's things we can take out of this from a schematics perspective. Uh, Wednesday will start to shift gears as we get ready for Rice next weekend. Rice had a really good game against Texas for the kinds of things that we expect out of Rice. Rice gave them some fits in the first half. Um, we'll hopefully talk to some people on Thursday about Rice and then kind of wrap up and hopefully go 2-0 and next week. And so it's a big, fun time here at Locked on Cougs. So subscribe so you can get the latest on the Houston Cougars each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. For a second listen, I am recommending Locked on Big 12 because it was a weird weekend in the Big 12, just at least. Let's let Drake tell you all about the Baylor Bears and the Texas Tech Red Raiders and all of that over there. <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right. Thank you all so much for making Locked on Cougs your personal day. Locked on Cougs, primary Locked on Podcast Network. That means your team every day. Go Cougs.